happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone. Can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors. Thank you, guys. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I'm Jason Verlindy, the editor of the Fretboard Journal Magazine. And as always, that is John Rauhaus playing in the background. If you tuned in last week to the amazing conversation I had with Aaron Draplin, you probably know this, but in case you didn't, Fretboard Journal is in the middle of its first ever subscription drive right now. Our goal is to convince as many of you guys out there and gals who have been enjoying the Fretboard Journal podcast and our free videos and all of our free content to finally subscribe to the magazine. So we are pulling out all the stops. We are inviting some of our favorite people back on this podcast. We are showcasing some never before seen videos and we are sharing some actual magazine articles on our website, something we rarely do to convince you guys and gals to subscribe to the magazine. I hope you will do so. You can go to fretboardjournal.com slash support to see all the different packages we have. Subscriptions start at just $30 and they do, do, do help us out in a very big way in terms of uh, getting better equipment, being able to do more of these interviews in person, and being able to do more cool stuff, which is what we really want to do for you guys. Uh, today on the podcast, one of our favorite people in the entire world, Mark Stupman of Folkway Music, is on the podcast. We are talking about CITES updates. We are talking about vintage Gibson and Martin repairs. We are talking about the life of a luthier and a small business owner and a lot more. You're going to love it. Mark's been on the podcast before. And next week, I will let the cat out of the bag. We have one of the most epic conversations I've ever had with TJ Thompson, another acclaimed repair person. Uh, This is a good one, folks. So if you subscribe to podcasts at all, you're going to want to subscribe to ours, at least for this this episode and next week's, because they are some of the best chats I've ever had. Um, I hope you enjoy them. Uh, Subscriptions are our lifeblood. I've said it a million times before. Um, It really is what helps us out the most. If you buy it at a store, uh, the wholesaler takes their cut. The freight company takes their cut. We have to pay for postage and everything. By the time it trickles back to us, it's kind of pennies on a dollar, but if you subscribe to a, to the magazine, uh, the money comes straight to us, which helps us out and lets us really flourish and put out more magazines. So that's that's the uh, logic there. We do have some sponsors, and we do have some sponsors for this very podcast, which is also uh, I'm something I'm very grateful for. First up is Mono Cases. I rock the Mono Vertigo bag. I love if you if you don't need a flight case, if you just need a uh, gig bag or a case that you can actually take to gigs without breaking your back. I cannot recommend mono cases enough. Uh, like I said, I have the Vertigo, but they have a whole bunch of cases that, uh, for every shape and size of guitar you could ever ask for, they are all very protective. They are all very ergonomic, and they all have pockets in all the right places for all of your stuff. So go to monocreators.com to check out their full line of offerings. We also are being sponsored once again by Retrofret Vintage Guitars over in Brooklyn. Retrofret moved. They are now in the Carroll Gardens neighborhood. They have a brand new showroom. And as always, they have some truly amazing guitars. They have a 1938 Martin 0018 for sale right now. They have a 66 Gibson Trini Lopez. Those are such beautiful instruments. And they have kind of an oddball thing, but probably the best value early Gibson you could look for, a 36 Gibson Black Special Number 4 Arch Top. That's an arch top, very plain black arch top with basically an L double O body, but then an arch top on top. Really, really cool guitars. You're going to be the only person on your block with that and uh, less than three grand. So um, if you want an early Gibson, if you want to hear what all the fuss is about, that's one way to get in with a low barrier of entry, I guess. Uh, what else can I tell you before uh, we talk to Mark? Uh, we, Like I said, we have all sorts of cool stuff on fretboardjournal.com and on our Instagram and on our Facebook. The Truth About Vintage Amps podcast, we just released our 19th episode. Tune into that. Give it a try, even if you don't think you care at all about amps. It's kind of the, uh, it's kind of addictive, uh, I guess is the the only way to describe it. I, I co-host it. I talked to uh, Skip Simmons, one of the world's best amp techs, who's based down in California, and it started out, 
with us fielding your questions on um, why your uh, deluxe reverb is humming when you play at whatever venue. And, and now we're somehow veering into soup recipes and uh, lifestyle tips and all sorts of other stuff. I, I know this is not doing it any justice, but it is quite a unique thing. Skip is a character. I'm the straight man. And uh, if nothing else, you will learn something about amplification, but you will also laugh over the course of every episode, which is something that is important. Uh, rest in peace, Daniel Johnston, one of the great musicians, a huge person in my life. Uh, I loved his music. And uh, if anybody out there has been reading the obits on him and uh, wants to start somewhere, there's a lot of great Daniel Johnston music, but there's also an incredible tribute album by Kathy McCarty that came out in the early 90s that I've been listening to a lot. She really transforms his songs, and uh, it is a great introduction to a uh, quirky, lo-fi, eccentric musician. Uh, it, it makes it the, the songs pretty accessible for anybody. So uh, sorry to read that Daniel passed away, but uh, he was he was awesome. So, all right, I don't want to end on a somber note. Uh, lots of other great things happening in the Fretboard Journal world. Uh, Fretboard Journal 45 is going to be coming out in a few weeks. All the people who subscribe now uh, through our subscription drive will be getting that issue. And we have a new electric issue coming towards the end of the year. And our pre-order button, I think, just went live on fretboardjournal.com in, under the shop tab. So... If you want to nab your copy, they sold out last year. Um, that would be the way to do it. And we have a ton of great stories gear loaded up for that. So, um, all right, without further ado, here is my conversation with Mark Stepman of Folkway Music. Thanks, everybody, for tuning into the Fretboard Journal podcast. Thank you for leaving us reviews over on iTunes. And most importantly, thank you for subscribing to the magazine itself and supporting us because we, uh, we want to keep this going. And we want to actually make it better and bigger than it is right now. Mark, thanks for being on the Fretboard Journal podcast. Hey, Jason. My pleasure. Thanks for having me back again. No, we're, we're having our first ever subscription drive, and we're bringing back some of our favorite guests as well as some new faces. And uh, nice. I wanted to make sure we talked to you. All uh, right. So you own one of the great guitar stores in North America, Folkway Music. Working on it. Uh, what, what's keeping you up at night as a uh, small business owner? <laughs> beyond my children yeah. um uh i guess just staying on top of the workflow to be honest with you um it's the store's thankfully doing real real well um we seem to you know there's still lots of people who are only now just discovering us which is lovely and um there's lots of guitars coming and going we're not we're not wanting for uh for much around here um a few more 30s J35s and jumbos and maybe you know the odd D18 would be nice mm -hmm. but um but no we're we're busy it, it it's just the repair the repair backlog is what's keeping me up at night and not having enough time to get them all done it's really hard to find enough time in the day i'm building a i'm building a shop in my in my house right now we have a one car garage that's um that's really just been a storage shed for bicycles and um you know wine bottles that are empty, and uh, so I, I've been working there trying to make a uh, climate-controlled insulated space um, that I can make into a home workshop. So after I get home at night, I can I can jump back to work. My store is about a half an hour drive from my house, um, and uh, in the early days of Folkway, I was located about a hundred feet from where I lived. But about seven years ago, we moved here to this other town, the next town over, Waterloo. Um, and so it's no longer convenient to just kind of swing by after dinner and get guitar repair done. So got to change that up and make some repair shop space at home. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. I insulated and built the floor yesterday and, and got to keep chipping away before the snow starts to fly around here so I can actually get in there this winter. But that'll be great if I can bring home, you know, if I can do neck resets at home at night, that, <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> I can, I, that, that'd be a good use of my of my time and space uh, over there. I was going to ask. So you you do some pretty high level repairs. You have people sending you guitars from around the continent and probably beyond. Uh, does the does the really high end hard stuff happen at your? Will it happen at your house or will it happen at the store? How does how do you break that's, that down? That's gonna be seen. I don't know yet. Um, there's a lot of tooling involved in guitar repair. There's a lot of jigs. Um, there's a lot of habitual use of space. So. You know, the way I work on a guitar is very, 
very much caused by the layout of my workbench. And so it's hard to translate your skills from one workbench area to another. You know, if I go down and visit um, my friend TJ in Boston, he's got nothing but bench space there, and so I might come down and hang out with him for a weekend and, you know, play with guitars. But it always feels weird being in that space, even though he's got, like, the wet dream of guitar repair shops it's still hard to work in that space because it's not my space that I'm used to. So I'm going to see how well I can set up that garage and and see if I could make it as comfortable as my main bench here at the shop. Um, And we'll see. It's it's a one-car garage, too, so it's not that much space. So, you know, I'm going to be limited. I can't go putting a big table saw in there because there's not really the space for that and other things. So um, we'll see. I I think I'll... uh, uh, I might not do lots of big structural repair there but things like neck resets that don't that's not much of a structural job you know you're not repairing cracks and gluing braces while you're at it like that that's something i can do at home easily and and in time i'll i'll build up the accoutrements that i need to do any job there but at the outset i'll probably just stick to things like that who knows maybe i, I don't know maybe i have this bit of a dream that maybe i'll i'll build a guitar or two but i, I think nice. it's a long way off to be honest with you <laughs> we'll see it's been a long time, so that'll be a really, uh, a really big wheel to start turning again. So, uh, since you're you're doing in the midst of this, I got to ask: like, you are, I'm imagining most luthiers are creatures of habit; they know where to reach for their tools and everything. Do yeah. you use a blank slate like this to kind of improve what you have at your shop, or are you just trying to replicate what you know and can do, like blindfolded? I, I'll probably do a little bit of both. Uh, In all honesty, um, when I set up this bench here at the Waterloo store seven years ago, uh, I changed my bench dramatically from what it used to be in the Guelph store. At my old shop, I set that shop up in 1999 when I was 25 and thought I would be a guitar builder for the rest of my life. And it was a guitar building bench, and and it just morphed as I bought new tools and, and made new jigs and things. They just ended up in funny places. Um... And the, now the new shop, like, there are no tools on the bench in front of me. Um, as so many so many people that work at benches do, all your tools are, like, in front of you and you just reach across. But there's a problem in that. If you have some $30,000 guitar on your bench and you reach for your wire cutters and and you have a hangover, <laughs> you know? <laughs> hey, you've already you talked encounter... about wine bottles, and now you're talking about hangovers. <laughs> I'm a little worried about you, Mark. There might be, um, you can encounter problems. You can do irreparable damage. And so uh, so all the all the tools are on the side, on the wall next to me. Um, there's a few tools in front of the guitars, but like little little light things and, and just um, nothing heavy and nothing, nothing that's going to really hurt a guitar. Um you know, and the lighting and where the lighting is and how high your benches are. When I built my shop here, I replicated my benches in my old shop at 36 inches, and then I realized that I was getting some back problems, and so I made a little riser that raised me up to 39 inches at my bench, and all of a sudden, like, my body doesn't hurt as much anymore. Um, even just this past week, I made... I wanted one of these uh, one of these guitar workstation jigs where your guitar is like on a pedestal and you can access any side of it. You can walk all around it, sort of almost like a barber chair. Um, Stu Max sells a, like a pedestal kind of thing. And there's no space for me to do that here in the shop. We've got other repair people and I can't just occupy the middle of the room. And so I made this little jig that sticks out from my bench that allows me to position the guitar really any at any angle from zero to 180 degrees. And, um, and that way I can work on the nut and without leaning in a funny way, or I could angle it and work on the side without leaning in a funny way. And already, like, I've only used that jig for three days now, but it's amazing. I'm already feeling, I feel like my work is, I'm able to be more accurate more easily, you know, and that's that's important stuff. You know, when you're making a, the way I make a, a nut on a Martin guitar, let's say, is I do the rough shaping and then I I, I glue the nut in place. And I do all the final shaping with the nut on the guitar because I believe that's the way Martin did it. Like they're carved in situ and then finished over. And um, and so that's the best way to get the edges 
uh, you know, the the sides of the nut looking right and the curve at the back of the nut to look right. But it's really hard to do if you're working from the side of your guitar. You sort of want to be at the end of your guitar and working on both sides and, and being ambidextrous, really. Like, I work the, the treble side with my left hand and the bass side with my right hand. It's sort of a bonus of being left-handed is it's easier to do things with my right hand because that's just the way the world is. Um, but this jig lets me do that. And I, I Like, man, if I was to set up... I mean, anything, hindsight's twenty twenty with any with anything, but after 20 years of working at a bench, you kind of figure out over time what is a good addition to the scene and what's a good deletion. And so, yeah, every time you set up a bench, it just gets a little bit better. That's one next time you chat with TJ, ask him about that, because he set up his his repair shop and he made it the guitar shop of dream of your dreams, of every guitar repair guy's dream. And uh, and so much thought went into every little detail. He that's a great question to ask him. He he'll he'll have fun telling you all about the all little right. tiny details. It's like a chef with their knives yeah. properly placed. Like a, yeah, totally. Like anything that is an ergonomic pursuit for sure. Nice. So uh, going back a little bit, about a week or two ago, obviously for folks who don't know, you are up in Canada in the Great White North. Yeah. Um, yes, about two weeks ago, there was the big uh, CITES announcement about yeah. not Brazilian rosewood, but the other rosewoods not being right. impacted. Does that impact you and, and how oh, guitars huge. flow back and forth? Um, well, most vintage guitars aren't made out of Indian rosewood. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're still made out of Brazilian, so it's not going to change that. Uh, you still need to get permits uh, for Brazilian rosewood that crosses the border. And I think that in time... Um, CITES will make that easier as well. The permits themselves are not a problem. It's just the simple fact that it takes long to get them. And then, um, and every time you cross the border, you need to get a new permit. So a customer could ship me their guitar after they get their permit. I could ship it back after I get my permit. Um, you can't cross the border twice on the same permit unless you're personally carrying it across with one of these CITES passports that exist. Um, I think in time, the Brazilian Rosewood transport the transport of brazilian rosewood vintage guitars will become easier too but there's not a very strong lobby uh to um there's not, not a strong lobby for change you know for brazilian rosewood instruments because people aren't manufacturing brazilian rosewood instruments um so we'll see i think it'll happen i think everything sort of the CITES folks are not trying to make life difficult for people you know that's just not the way that um, that their job is going to be effective because they want compliance. And the best way to make people comply is to make things easy. And so they're always trying to figure that out, and their hearts are in the right place, and they're not, they're not trying to be a bureaucratic nightmare. So there, it's a convention that is um, exercised differently in every country, and there are going to be some hurdles and hiccups there. But all in due time, Brazilian, will, I think, will become easier. But in the interim... Um, 90 days out of that decision that they made, Indian Rosewood is going to be back to sort of how it was in 2017, sort of, kind of, um, meaning you won't need to have a permit for to ship Indian Rosewood guitars. And I'll tell you, that's going to make being a Canadian guitar uh, sales, sales person or guitar retail store hugely easier. Um, we do warranty repair for Martin, for Taylor, and, you know, it's hard to do warranty returns on guitars for customers um, because of the CITES thing. Um, just getting guitars here for resale is a pain in the butt because you have to pay all these extra fees uh, for the CITES documentation. And I mean, with Callings, they ship their Indian Rosewood guitars to Texas um, for CITES, something to do with CITES, you know, certification, and then. From Texas to Canada, so there's an extra shipping cost involved. There's fees involved. So it will make things much better for us here in Canada selling new instruments and needing to return new instruments across the border. We also sell plenty of not vintage guitars to people all over the world. So somebody wants a 70s Martin that's covered in Indian rosewood. Well, now all of a sudden, again, I could, I could sell that guitar to an American without needing them to wait a month for a CITES permit. So we're really excited about it. I'm really happy that that happened. And, um, yeah, we're kind of high fives all around with that. I can't imagine how complicated this must be. <laughs> oh, it's crazy, for I mean, sure. We're, yeah. 
No, I was going to say, I, I know John Thomas, our frequent contributor, has one, but I don't think I've ever actually seen anyone with one of those CITES passports. There can't be that many of them. Maybe... I don't I don't think there's that many of them uh, either. I mean, I, I've never applied for one because I just... I just don't. I don't travel with my guitar. I'm not a musician I'm traveling everywhere. But um, and I, I honestly don't think that all these, you know, touring musicians actually bother either. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah. There's like, a lot of that. Like how many how many musicians that are playing guitars actually have Sadie's passports for all their guitars? I I, I kind of don't think that many do. But like ultimately, they're not. You know we're not the big problem, and 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 enforcement officials know that, and nobody's out to get anybody with this. Um, the only times I've heard of people having instruments confiscated that I know of is because that person maybe wasn't the easiest to deal with at the border. You know, <laughs> it might have sure. been a personality thing. Sure. So, um, thankfully, it's never been a big issue, but it, it has been a big hurdle in terms of retail sales and cost of doing business. And I'm really glad from a business owner perspective, because we do, I do a lot of new instrument sales up here that, um, I'm really glad to see that as, uh, is on the process of, in the process of changing. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, uh, what's in your store right now that you're excited about? Right now, um, there's a few things around. There's a lot in process that I'm excited about that I just haven't had the chance to finish yet. I mean, I've got, I have more LOOs in the store right now, or early 30s Gibsons in the store right now than I've had in, in years. Wow. But they're all waiting for me to actually work on them. <laughs> and so that's a little tricky for me. Wait, so how does um, that work? Are you buying basket case LOOs or are people consigning ones that they never got around to repairing and then you I'm need to buying, fix them I'm trading. Like, if okay. somebody comes into my store and they've got, they've got some old Gibson, we pretty much... Like we work really hard on making that guitar stay here, um, and so so there's a lot of them. I like if there's, I mean, I can fix guitars, and so there's no guitar that's not worth having. The problem is that the values of these guitars are still not high enough to make me fixing them worthwhile. You know, so there's I've got this one guitar that's so cool. It's it's an HG20 from 1932, and uh, just an awesomely cool guitar. And thankfully, it doesn't need brace repairs. Like, every brace is tight, which is crazy for an old Gibson. Um, and it doesn't even need a neck reset, which is equally crazy. It needs a bridge re-glue, but it has a section of top that's broken. Um, like, on a piece, like a piece of spruce missing from, you know, where your armpit would be on the lower bout. And it's this crazy color that Gibson only used for that short period in 32. And, um, and it's really hard to get at because the way that guitar is built, it has this these these extra set of signs that are hanging from the inside of the top. And this little piece of broken wood is in between the extra set of side and the normal side. And so I can't get in there to, like without taking the back off, I can't get in there to to support the underside of this repair when I, when I do it. Oh my God, it's such a huge job to make that go away. And um, there's no time and there's no money in that guitar. Like once it's done, what's it worth? Like maybe $4,000. So I can't go spending... 30 hours repairing a guitar that's worth $4,000. So it just sits here and, you know, maybe that's the kind of thing I'll take home to my garage once it's built. These things that they, they don't have the, that I can just like, you know, pay myself four cents an hour to fix. And um, it's just because I want to, you know, that's where the hobby side of this whole thing happens. Uh, I got into this whole game because it was my hobby and then now it's my profession and all of a sudden I actually have to make money at my hobby and you, I, I find that you can't do something as thorough as you'd like to unless the dollars are behind it. And, you know, repairing small body old Gibsons, the dollars are not usually behind it. And so it's really, it's often a money losing pursuit, but, uh, but it's worth it. So anyways, long and short, I'm sitting on lots of Gibson, lots of Gibsons. There's four Calcroydons in the store right now, Okay. which is nuts. I don't think I've ever had four at once. And, uh, and they, they range from like the most lightweight, crazy, you know, late 29 Calcroid into heavier um, 1931 models, and they sound entirely different. And um, some need neck resets. They all need braces re-glued. And, um, some have necks that are spaghetti noodles, and others have really great necks with full thickness fingerboards. And it's cool to see 
like I know about all these various changes and when they happened and in and, and, and the way that guitar is put together and, and the specifications of braces and bridge plates and top thicknesses and all that, but it's really neat as a show and tell object to have them all here at the same time and show the guys that work here, hey, check out this guitar, look how thick the bridge plate is, look how thin the top is, how the top is graduated from the center to the edges. Like These things slowly evolved, you know, or quickly, I guess, maybe evolved in those couple of years, and it's neat to see them all. Anyways, we have that. We've got this. I got this really cool um, sort of pre-Robert Johnson era L1. Okay. That same body size, that small body, um, but from when the L1 just became a flat top, um, the L ones were, you know, it was, a, it was an arch top instrument, the arch top and back, and then they went to having, um, well, they were partially arch top guitars. Uh, they had a flat. Um, they had this sort of flat top with arch back thing and then they went to this um the regular flat tops but those very first flat tops with their h bracing um and huge strangely wide necks and they were weird guitars totally weird and so this one is like the first the earliest one i've seen that that has like the the rubbed sort of cremona sunburst that we're used to seeing on those late 20 small gibsons yeah um it's the earliest one with a sunburst and um it's still an H brace, but it has some neat, some neat more modern features to it, and uh, it's a it needs one of everything. It, like every brace is loose, and it needs a reset, and the bridge has fallen off of it, and there's missing binding. Like it's it's in rough shape. All it's right. going to be a long job, but it's a neat guitar to see from from the whole continuum of Gibson models. I won't so ask cool. you how that sounds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't ask, yeah. It'll be a long time before I can tell you what that sounds <laughs> like. I've got this. Uh, we have a refinished A35 in the store that was that is a really cool guitar. I'm looking forward to getting done. It's it's not a, it's not a gross refinish. It's a really nicely done one that somebody cared enough to do really well. And oh man, there's lots of that kind of stuff. But um, uh, no no advanced jumbos right now. Last time we talked, I think there were three advanced jumbos yeah. in the store. <laughs> so there are none right now. Uh, so that's you know a little less, less exciting, but. I don't know. Every day there's something new and interesting that shows up. It might not be an old Gibson. Maybe it's some some cool '50s Fender or whatever. But there's interesting stuff to learn and look at look at yeah. all the time. Which is a fun perk of the job. So so these Kel Croydons, just to go back from yeah. ten feet away, do they look identical or are they different models? Oh, they look identical from from three inches away. Okay. You know, they're, they're they all. I mean, with the exception of the neck thickness, um, the earliest Kel Croydons had standard thickness fingerboards, and then uh, maybe 200 batches, 200 factory order numbers later, they had the skinny noodle neck, you know, the half thickness fingerboards that Gibson's had, mm -hmm. and around that time that Kelkroyd's all had, and um, so that's a visible difference, but aside from that, there's really, you don't really see too many differences between these things, it's really when you look inside the guitars, uh, with a mirror or with measuring tools that you really notice the difference, for sure. So is there, I know this is a really subjective thing, but, you know, there's all these vintage instruments that we see Joe Henry play or whomever, and we are like, I want that L00, I want that whatever. And I know it's all in the ear of the beholder, but is there a sweet spot in terms of, you know, when you look at those four Kelcroydons, does one stand out? Is there a formula where you're like, you know, this is this is where they nailed it? So it depends on what you're after in your ears, you know. And in my opinion, the whole allure of those Kelcroydons, those gold sparkle L2s, those L1s, they're the very first ones. They're the ones built in late 29 when Gibson switched from the small body to the larger body L size um, around the factory order number 9460, 9490, 9500, right around there okay. is when Gibson switched to their large body. And that's when, uh, similar to Martin's sort of OM models, um, that's when everything was accidentally, magically wonderful. And... Um, they built those guitars so lightly, so lightly. They're x brace, but they're, the braces are teeny tiny. The tops are thin. The bridge plates are tiny. They're not for everybody. You, you're a flat picker, and you're, you, know, you want a, an old Gibson. Don't buy one of those things. It just won't work for you. It'll just sound wiry and 
and it'll uh, it won't have the header in that you want. Like they're just not for that kind of playing. But if you want a guitar that just has this wonderful, um, this crazy, wonderful open smoky warmth that um, I, it's so hard to describe describe i mean on my website i use the word rich and warm and dark and smoky like just way too much but i can't think of other words to use you know there's this this thing that happens and the overtone like incredible overtone development so you're not into overtones forget about it um but um there's just a certain thing about those guitars that that uh, that sounds unlike anything else that you'll ever hear and it's just because it's so so lightly built um, so basically, it's essentially a really lightly classical, like lightly built classical with steel strings on it. Is what the, those guitars are. And by the time a half a year later, the braces got bigger and bridge plates got bigger and everything got. They're still phenomenal guitars and they're way more lightly built than anything from the mid '30s. But they're they're just different. Those are guitars that you can flat pick. See, I I don't personally own one of those 1929 or early 1930 12 fretters. Um, because I'll overpower it. I can't make them sound good the way I play, the way I like to play. Um, but I, you know, when I'm play testing them, and I can, I, I totally get what they're about. And when you hear someone who plays those guitars for what they do, um, you really get it. Like, a, like Joe Henry, for example, or my friend Rose Cousins, who had me search for a long time for a Kelcord, and that was like this bird's model that I had once upon a time. And um, it just works, and they're they're really inspiring for songwriters, really inspiring for songwriters. They just they just they're perfect for that role, and um, but they're not lead guitars, you know. And I and I flat the guitars, and I want something that's powerful and hoppy and and has overtones, but is a really strong fundamental. Those are the kind of guitars I play. So I don't play one of those. My my twelve fret Gibson's from thirty two, which is pretty late for a twelve fretter, but it's built a little bit heavier and it can handle a much harder right hand attack in my case left handed because I play left handed and um and they have more pop uh and more power down low and you can play lead guitar on them they're sort of i would say more along the tonal spectrum that you would hear in um David Rawlings land you know they have poppy mid range dry uh clear fundamental power great treble thickness you know that's sort of what i like on a guitar um and so i have a i've got a 12 fret you know from 32 and i've got a, a, a 14 fret from 33 and uh which are just the two magic guitars for me but we're all different you know um i would say though that there are great later 30s gibsons but i i would love to see the the vintage market sort of learn the difference between the early 30s and the late 30s. An L00 is not just an L00. The same way an OM is not an OM. You know, a 1930 OM is a very different animal than a 1932 OM. And um, the same changes apply. That, I, mean, I think we talked about this maybe on a lot of We did, yeah. Podcast too, but, um, but yeah, there's, you know, so few people have played enough of these things to get that there are the differences from year to year, from early to late, are so significant that they should you know they should have some impact on pricing um, there's just not enough of them out there for people to have had enough experience with them but those of us who specialize in these things we sort of know that um, but yeah so it's neat to see so it's cool to see these calcroidians spanning uh, the course of two years and see how they change and, and mix that in with like a mahogany LO or an L1 that's in the store uh, there's got to be oh there's a 13 fret we've got a 13 fret L double O still I'm, I that, I had that one last time we chatted too and it's still it's there in process <laughs> okay it's still here it got back murdered pretty heavily for a while but it's going to get front burnered again soon no it's just neat it's really cool to see all that stuff all at once and document so, it all so every you know self-professed and amateur guitar collector acoustic guitar collector knows that. In the 70s and 80s, bracing got heavier because of warranty issues and companies wanted, you know, it's just, everybody yep. knows that. For yep. these guitars that are so extremely lightly braced, how have they held up? Is it defy the odds and are they, you know, anomalies and that they actually are still structurally sound? So, sort of, yeah. Um, many haven't held up. Okay. And And that's why you see, if you look at Gibson Jumbos from 1934... 
like good luck finding one that the top still has a nice arch and its original bridge is its original plate and no top deflection. Like it just won't happen because those guitars were built like a big L double O. The tops were, you know, twenty percent thinner than what they were two years later and um and they couldn't handle string tension. Um and so they fell apart. Second to that you see guitars that have cracks and some that don't so any any vintage guitar that's got cracks is probably built in the summer, and ones that don't have cracks are probably built in the winter. And and really, the, the fact that winter guitars last is super apparent here in Canada, A, and super apparent with, in particular, these very early Gibsons um, that didn't have a lot of structural integrity at the outset. Um, if a guitar is built with a with a Gibson is built with a with a radius to its top. And the guitar dries out. The first thing that happens is that radius becomes less of a dome and more flat. And a lot of the strength in a Gibson top is due to that radius. That radius puts strength in a top, and which is which is why these guitars were able to get away with having such light construction because they had this radius top. Um, if that radius flattens out, all of a sudden you're asking a lot more of that X brace and other braces, but the X-Brace in particular, to support. Um, and uh, and that's not really fair to the braces, and particularly these very early 30s Gibsons where the braces, the glue surface is between 150 to 200 thousandths of an inch wide, which is like nothing. Um, they just don't have enough strength, and they, they let go, and that's why you have Gibsons that have X-Braces that have let go of the upper part and, and a lot of caving around the sound hole. Um, if a guitar is built right and nice and dry and, and it dries out, it it won't dry past the point of flattening its top out. So keeping the radius alive on a top that's built with a radius top um, is super critical to its the guitar's long-term life. And I think that, that that's that's a biggie. I don't even know how we got onto that topic. <laughs> no, I want to keep talking about it. I mean, but, uh, yeah. that's my take on that one, for sure. The, the, you know, I, we've discussed this before when you've been on the podcast, but there are, uh, you know, I feel like the the classic Martin sound is something that isn't easy to replicate, but a number of people, you've mentioned T.J. Thompson, there's Martin themselves, um, pre-war, like it, it's a sound that can get, we can get close to the vintage sound pretty pretty uh-huh. well. With Gibsons, uh-huh. it's such a different... An old Gibson never sounds like... A, a new Gibson recreation never really sounds like an old Gibson, at least to my ears. Yeah. Um, if if our friends over at Gibson, who I should add are sponsoring this podcast amongst some others, uh, if they hired yeah. you as a consultant, let's say, uh, yeah. how close could anyone get there in 2019 or 2020? Could you, with enough time and materials and uh, effort nail that old sound i'm hopeful that i could but i think that it would be um maybe a little well pompous for lack of a better word to think that i actually could um there's magic in those old guitars um that magic was maybe in the wood it was maybe in the in the craft people to build it maybe in the glue maybe in you know how much glacial ice, glacial ice there was. I mean, I don't know, but it's possible. Yes, I can blueprint a guitar, and yes, I can I can physically build a Gibson that would be identical to an old uh, early '30s Gibson. Um, you can map that all that out. Would it sound the same? I don't know, man. I really don't know. Maybe this is why I haven't started building guitars yet. Cause maybe <laughs> I don't want to find out. Um, but. Age does so much to a guitar. String tension over time. Torrified woods are helping. There's no question. Guitars made with torrified woods sound great. Um, I think that's part of it. Torrified woods and high glue. Um, using old wood to start with. But I think just string tension on the guitar, the the shrinking of the celluloid over time, all these things, the, the fret wire that's used, you know, I, I'm surprised. Like I've changed fingerboards on guitars, and it's completely changed the guitar for better or for worse. But just changing a fingerboard can have such a huge effect on the sound of a guitar. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I, there's hubris there. I, I don't think that that we can say that we can make an old guitar, a new guitar that sounds old. But I think that I can get pretty darn close if I was given if I was given the materials and the time and the budget to do it. Um, but I, I, yeah, I'm sure some would be really close and others would suck is what it would come down to. <laughs> and uh, eventually you get better and better. But yeah. In, you, you mentioned the fingerboard thing. Did you, have you ever regretted changing a fingerboard? Um, from a tone perspective, I have. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have on a couple guitars. Um, I've regretted changing bridges on a couple guitars too. Um, the bri- the mass of a bridge makes a huge difference to the sound of a guitar. And sometimes you get a guitar that just sounds magical. It needs a neck reset. The saddle is really low, and the bridge has been shaved down to three sixteenths of an inch. Sure. But the guitar sounds incredible. And so your logic as a repair guy is, hey, I'm going to fix this, and I'm going to make this thing play as well as it sounds. And so you reset the neck and take that pancake of a bridge off, and you make a... F- a replica bridge. I'm pretty pretty good at making bridges that look and that look exactly right and are dimensionally identical. Um, you know, and sometimes it doesn't work out, and you have a good, it just doesn't sound as good as it could, or it did as good as it did before. I mean, maybe part of it is the strings were 14 years old and they sounded incredible. Mm-hmm. This is the challenge with guitar repair: is that you know, uh, the enemy of good is often better, and that's a long, hard lesson to learn. Um, you know, sometimes you just want to leave things alone if it sounds good. Maybe this is what you talk about with Skip, too. I don't know. But, you know, sometimes the, when cap values drift in an amp, that's what makes that amp yeah. magical, you know. And and the same thing is true with guitars. Sometimes these terrible old strings and these bridge pins that fit badly and the nut that has a gap underneath it and the saddle is not glued. Maybe that's why that guitar has that magic. And when you make a properly fit saddle that's glued in and a nut that fits right and frets that are actually seated, maybe you take that that vibe away. Frequently, and more often than not, when you do all that, the guitar is that much better. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to say the guitar repair is not necessary, but <laughs> I mean, my, my track record is 95% of the time when you make a guitar better, it's better, and it's a lot better. And that's that's sort of what I go by. But every now and then, every now and then, you get this one guitar that just is magical. And you can kind of tell when you meet that guitar for the first time. You know, you can tell just from looking at it, playing at it, you know. I say, like, buddy, like, don't fix this thing. It's it's incredible. Don't change, don't change anything here because it's such a magical piece of guitar, music-making, you know, guitar. Um most often than not, than not, you can make them better. But th- yeah, those every now and then, there are those guitars. So that takes me back to wondering, hey, like, what else is in there that's making a guitar sound great? Which is part of why I haven't, I won't say yes, I can make a, an old Gibson, a new Gibson that that is just like an old one. Um, I don't think it's very easy. But um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting lesson to learn over the years. It's sort of like the wisdom of a guitar builder or a repair guy. Um, and and I'm only uh, hopefully halfway through my career here. I think there's a lot of wisdom left to learn. But where I'm currently at is that there are magical guitars, and and sometimes that magic is is not something that you should play with. It it sounds like at least a few times you've had to tell a customer like, don't mess with this. Yeah, I do, and it's not just because I'm busy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, some yeah. I, 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 it's not infrequent. I, I have no tolerance for guitars that don't work properly. So if you have a guitar that's messed up and sounds magical but just doesn't work, you can't play it. Well, I'm sorry, magic or not, if you're not going to play the guitar, there's no sense. You know, mm-hmm. we'll we'll try to find that magic. I have I have kept, you know, ten year old strings and put them back on after I finished a neck reset. Let's say, um, you know, because there's a lot of good that comes out of dead strings on certain guitars. And um, a lot of players don't want their strings changed ever. Like, don't mess with that mojo. Those are my strings. That's my sound. Um, and that's fine. I, I can I can deal with that. Um, but, uh, yeah. 
I don't even know where I was. I just no, I, na- you know, we, we famously never ask anybody about uh, strings just because it seems really boring. But since we're talking about uh, relatively niche guitars, these vintage Gibsons, do you have a favorite yeah. string that you put on the guitars when you uh, aren't trying to save 10-year-old strings? Um, my favorite strings are now called Darko D220. Um, and Martin rebranded all their strings, and those were the strings that were called the M540s. They're regular Foster Bronze Lights. They're also called Clapton's Choice. Um, in their in their redoing of their string line, um, they have changed um, that M540, and and they basically call that string now the Darko D220. And it's a Foster Bronze. It's a plain old Foster Bronze string with no fanciness going on with this plain the plain uh, strings. There's no, it doesn't have coatings or high carbon steel or anything like that. Those are my favorite. Um, other guitars, those those strings to my ear have like a a strength to them because of um, some kind of difference in the core wire. I'm no string scientist, so I don't really know what the difference is, but they feel different um, and uh, they feel a little stiffer and they they sound a little thicker, um, which is always a good thing on a Gibson guitar. Yeah. Um, other guitars, uh, listen, on my one guitar, on, the, on my one uh, 12-fret L00, it came in with a dead set of Dario EJ-16s on it. And they were really dead. And the guitar is right-handed, and when I decided to keep it, I had to convert it to left-handed. And so I took those strings off, and I, I converted the guitar, and I filled and recut the saddle slot and made a new knot. And I even put side dots in on that one because I knew I'd never sell it. And... Um, and I put those very strings on <laughs> again, just because I knew that they were part of the magic of that guitar. And I've never restrung it since. Um, I'm I'm one of those people that doesn't re- like restringing their own guitars. I I don't I don't like the sound of new strings. And um, every now and then you sort of just have to. But I also <laughs> I I keep if somebody comes in for a setup and we're changing the strings and the strings aren't pooched, um, I'll keep them and I'll save them. You know, for my guitar or for somebody else who wants. Oh, print, okay. Print, you know, um, I was so going to ask good. what happens if you break one on a ten-year-old. It sucks. Set. It yeah. totally sucks to break <laughs> to break a string if you're an old string guy. You know, other guitars though, are, you know, they just work really great with new strings. Um, and but it's not my, my ear. To my taste, the guitars that I like the best are, or the guitars that I think are great are guitars that can do old strings well. And there's certain guitars that just can't do old strings well. But other guitars can, um, but that's just you know where I am at in my own evolution as a guitar player. You know, maybe one day I'll be a better guitar player and I'll really want what new new guitar strings do. Every good guitar player that I know plays on new strings. You know, <laughs> there must be something to that. <laughs> maybe <laughs> they, they want the definition because they can control everything else with their with their own attack. But I'm too I'm too shoddy of a guitar player. So I want I want dead strings. Maybe Clearly. it hides my errors better. Or something. Clearly, someone needs to relic strings and and package them as. Such. Oh my God! Can you imagine? <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> it seems seems like if enough people are out there, relic wanting... relic strings. Oh my God! We should do that. That could be the next business for fretboard journal. You can start marketing All relic right. guitar strings. All right, I can't wait for the hate mail. <laughs> totally. What? What? Uh, you're a bit of a guitar snob. What new guitars are you excited about? Um, I, I we've had a lot of impressive, neat guitars lately, and you know what? Um, there's been a lot of new. I think the new. Well, I'll speak about acoustics because that's really my wheelhouse. Um, I've been really impressed by a lot of new electrics, but it's just not what I know tons about. I just like electrics and I like playing them. But um, as far as new acoustics go. There's a lot on the market that's fabulous right now. I have to say one of the most exciting guitars I have in the store, you're going to laugh, but it's a Martin DSS-17. I absolutely love that guitar. It's, um, it's, it's a 17 series, so it's, it's a fairly, fairly budget guitar from Martin. All solid woods, sure, satin finish. It's their slope shoulder thing. It's got a, you know, sunburst. Mm-hmm. But it has a small it has a small little rectangle bridge and a small little bridge plate. It's got scallop braces. Um and it's lightly built. And there's it's an incredible guitar. It's just an absolutely amazing sounding guitar and um and I, I was blown away when we got that guitar in, our first one of those things. 
a lot of those 17 series Martins um, are really nicely built, really lightly built, responsive, warm, uh, really great out of the box kind of guitars. So I've been really, it's nice to see a great sounding guitar at that price point from Martin. Sure. Um, they've just redesigned their 16 series, uh, and I've not played one yet. I've not seen them yet. They haven't arrived, but on paper they should be very exciting. Um, and then, you know, and I still think that their authentics are some of the best guitars being made. Period. Um, you know, the OM28 authentic is far and away consistently the best guitar in our store. Whenever we have one, they're just amazing sounding instruments as far as new guitars go. So that that's pretty cool. Um, and then you know we we're a Collings dealer and we love we love our traditional series Collings. They're just incredible, and we love our Waterloo Calling. Like they're all great. So I'm always excited when we get a new new Collings model in. We have pre-war a few pre-war models that we've never had uh, coming in this week or next. I'm really excited about that. Yeah. We're, we're getting an O size pre-war, like an O18 um, pre-war. And then we have like a we have one of their J models coming in a short scale. Oh, I was going to ask. 45. Yeah, it's our first one. I've never, You'll be I've a never had... discerning judge of that. I, yeah, I might be. Um, so um, we'll see what the pros says on our website once we get it. Um, <laughs> Is there then, a way to uh, tell? Can folks read between the lines about I, whether or not I you're enthusiastic? Think, I think so. I think anyone who's read our website long enough can tell. It's my voice on the website. Like I type every one of those website write-ups, right? So anybody who has been following the site for these past 20 years will know All right. when I'm excited about something and when I'm not. You Do know? you have a stock so, <laughs> phrase you use when you're not that excited, but it sounds okay? Uh, I don't. I really try to avoid the stock <laughs> phrases. Okay. But if I wax poetic about tone, it's because I should. Okay. And if I don't say anything about tone, maybe that's not the guitar's, you know, Strong suit. <laughs> so, All right. That makes sense. I just, uh, I, it's important for me to, for our guitars to be accurately described, and, and um, there's a lot of bias in my website write ups. They're really from my ears, and I mean, there's, it's a bit of a problem, really, because maybe I don't like a guitar, but uh, our sale, one of our sales guys, JJ or Rich or Mike, they, they might love the guitar, but they didn't write the website update. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's good to have all these different perspectives, but ultimately I'm the guy that wrote the thing. And so if I like the guitar, I'll I'll say lots about that. All right. Anyway, so those. Uh, so I'm excited to see those. And then, um, in all honesty, that the 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 Grand Pacific, the mahogany Grand Pacific from Taylor, the 517. Sure. Um, that's a killer guitar. They totally they totally got something right on that guitar, and. Um, and I, there's not much, there's really, I love everything about the guitar. I like, I really, really, really like the neck shape on it. They changed the neck shape and gave it a beefier, rounder, again, more Gibson-y kind of feel. It's it's basically their version of a J45, except that it has a long scale neck and it says Taylor on the headstock and it has a bolt-on neck and, well, okay, lots of other things, but it's just <laughs> going after the J45 market. Aside from all that, yeah. And, um, and and it sounds really good. Does it sound like a J45? No, it still sounds like a Taylor, but it's a Taylor with a heavy dose of that sort of J45 thump in it, and that that what I call thickness in the treble strings, that round, fat, thick treble response, and that sort of thump through the mid range of the bass. Um, but with a lot of the definition of a Taylor, and a little extra power for the long scale. Uh, long scale neck. There's something about it though, with that V bracing that they're doing and the and that tail and the Gibsony kind of shape. It, it works. It works really well. Um, so, you know, I have to be excited about all the guitars that we sell. And when Taylor came up with that, I was like, Hey, look at this! You made a guitar for a vintage Gibson snob to be excited about. And and uh, I was I was cool with that. You know. So. Do you ever nice. do you ever get to you know? I know when I sometimes follow you around the Nam show. We usually. Uh, sharing a house together there, but um, I know you have to talk to the sales reps and, you know, place your orders and everything, but do you ever get to have the direct feedback and back and forth with the Andy Powers or the Bob Taylors or, you know, uh, the actual people who are designing these guitars and tell them what works or what doesn't work as a store owner? I try. Okay. I do try. Um, it, it, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would love that opportunity. Um, 
But in all honesty, like, you know who I am, but I'm just some guy that owns a guitar store somewhere and has opinions. I mean, there's a lot of people that have opinions and would like to share them. And so the the people who design guitars for these companies, they get nothing but an earful from lots of people. And what makes my opinion any more valid than anybody else's? Nothing. So, no, I, you know, I, it would be fun. It would be really fun to get hired on as a consultant for anybody and, and help in that process. I really love that. Um, but but no, I've never really had that. Um, I'm a warranty repair person from Martin, and so I have a bit of a, I have a bit of a pipeline to their their QA department. And so, you know, if I notice QA related things with Martin, um, I have I, I have some effect there. So you know, if the nut spacing is not as good as it needs to be, or there's you know saddle heights are too high, or something like that, mm-hmm. I can I can help. You, you know, tuners that are tuners that aren't working right you know so that that can help but it doesn't really i don't i don't have any conduit to helping in the guitar design process as much fun as that would be that would be like my dream job but no i'm nowhere close to that all right companies you're listening yeah you can hire this guy yeah (laughs) that'd be fun for sure um you talked about the uh the extensive backlog of repair do you have um helpers on the horizon or do you have any apprentices or anyone who do you want well, to the, go there so we have uh, there's me and two other full-time repair people here okay. at folkway so grant mcbride and and ken and our are two other full-time repair guys and um and they are each and both amazingly skilled repair people i'm really glad that they're here and uh between the two of them i think there's 18 or 20 years of of time here at the shop, so they're not they're not newbies, um, and uh, and then we have you know we have some part time help that you know to do setups and we've trained them doing setups or small jobs pickup installs what have you. Um, I don't have any other buddy helping me. In all honesty, I I don't um, I just can't. I don't have the wherewithal to train anybody else. I don't have the time in my life to do that. Sure. Um, maybe later in life. Did I ever tell you about how I got into this business and, and me applying, like after I learned how to build guitars, me applying for guitar jobs? Go I, ahead. I tell, now that you've I don't know planted if I told that you this seed, on another, go ahead. I don't know if I told you this on a previous phone call, but um, so when I finished guitar building, I learned how to build guitars with Serge DeYoung yeah. here in Canada. He's sort of like the Canadian father of guitar builders at this point. Um, it was in 97, 98, early 98, uh, and I was looking for uh, any any kind of job with guitar repair people. I didn't tell you this. Oh, man. I, to listeners who have heard this story, I apologize, but I'm going to say it again anyway. Um, the, uh, at that point, it was pre-internet, and um, I basically was a member of um, Asia, the Association of String Instrument Artisans, mm-hmm. and the Guild of American Luthiers. But anyways, Asia... Uh, sent out as part of their membership package um, a directory of all their members. And so I took this directory, it was basically a telephone book, and um, and I applied for a job with every guitar builder or repair person, everyone in Canada that was listed, everyone on the eastern seaboard of the United States uh, and New England, Everybody on the west coast of the United States, Jeez. everybody in the southwest of the United States, which were the places that I would want to live, okay. basically. And um, I sent out 400 letters by mail with a cover letter and a resume. Um, and uh, and that's I applied for jobs. I was, all right, I'm going to get a job doing something with guitars. Anyways, uh, 40 responses of those 400... Of those 40, four people said, hey, you're interesting to me. Let's follow up. So four, that's 1%, four out of 400. And then of those four, it led me to one guy um, who was interested enough that I flew down out west to meet him and, um, and hang out there for a week and, you know, fix guitars and just do guitar stuff in a shop for a week. And in the end, uh, it didn't work for a number of reasons. And, um, and that was that. And that was the end of this. And, 
and I couldn't find 400 letters, and there wasn't a single person. Now, granted, I didn't have much to offer. I just had learned how to build guitars, and that's, sorry, I'm not bringing much but a keen attitude. So there wasn't, um, there was nobody that wanted to hire me, and which is why Folkway came to be, because I couldn't find a job, so I just made my job. But, um, but what I'm saying with that is that as now the guy who gets resumes and people finishing guitar repair school that want jobs and things, Man, I totally get why I didn't get a job back then. I totally get it. Like, there's no time. You don't want to hire somebody. Like, um, it's just, it's just, it's really hard unless you're set up as a as a teaching place to put the resources into teaching um, someone. You want someone who has the um, the yen for knowledge to learn themselves. You know, and so those people are out there too. Um, but generally speaking, the people that have uh, the, such a strong desire to make it happen, just go make it happen. <laughs> you know, they just they can make it happen on their own. You know, and so uh, so it is. It's I I get why nobody was at all interested in in hiring me, and I, I know why back then in '99. I was offered a job to relocate to a completely different city in a much more expensive city to live in than where I was living um, to work for somebody building their guitars for $7 an hour. I mean, no, <laughs> I can't do that. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's tricky, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of great guitar. There's Now it's a very different landscape. You can learn. Uh, there's a few different schools of guitar repair and guitar building. Now there's there's so much available online. Um, even just hanging out on Stu Max YouTube channel, there's stuff to, to learn there. So there's so many places where uh, someone who's interested in this biz can just go and learn now. That that wasn't the case a generation ago. Um, but still, I I, I think I'm going to be a much older uh, a much older person before I take on something somebody that resembles an apprentice yeah. at this point. Which is too bad because I'd love to give back somehow, you know. I kind of, I, I, I want to share the knowledge that I've got. I don't really know how to, effectively, short, short of doing podcasts with you and, you know, our Instagram feed. But, um, yeah. But bringing on an apprentice is not, unfortunately, not the way that it can be. Hearing you talk about that, and this could be a whole career counseling podcast episode, which yeah, right. which maybe would be more lucrative than talking about guitars. Um, was there the trial by error, the doing it yourself, like bootstrapping this whole thing? Um, could that learning curve had been? Could it have been reduced had you worked for a larger company? Are there certain things that, looking back, you're like, wow, for the first five years, why was I doing it this way? Oh, there's no question. No question at all. I mean, basically, I my learning curve. So back then, in ninety eight, ninety nine, whenever it was, like three months after I opened my store, um, I went to an Asia Symposium in Nashville, and I met two people who forever changed my life. Um, one was Craig Korth, who's a yeah, Canadian. Craig. You know Craig from yeah. Middle Fingers. Yeah. Um, he uh, he's a Canadian musician. And he turned me on a to vintage instruments, which I and at that point in my life I was completely unaware of, completely yeah. and totally. I was like, "Give me a Taylor, give me a Larry, I knew nothing." And um, he turned me on to vintage instruments. He had, uh, you know, he introduced me to, to Lloyd Lohr. He introduced me to Gibson flat top banjos, and um, uh, and he introduced me to heavy picks. Up until that point, I used yellow Dunlop Tortex picks and and hit the guitar harder and harder and harder trying to make it sound good and just ended up breaking strings. And so he introduced me to um to heavy to have like seriously heavy nicely beveled picks and how to hold them and he taught me how to uh, how to attack the pick and how to hold hold my pick and hold my hand and find where your best tone is, which is it was like the single biggest lesson I'd ever learned in that point in my life of having played guitar 20 years at that point. No one ever showed me that, and so from a guitar playing perspective, that was he was hugely influential, and still is to this day. I credit him with like everything. Then, then the same weekend, I met TJ. I met TJ Thompson, and and he was just there, and he had a little table set up, 
uh, of just stuff that he was selling. He had like guitar tops and guitar parts, and and uh, I remember I, I he had the set of banjo tuners, and I picked them up, and he says to me, "You need those." And I looked at him like, "What? What? <laughs> Who are you?" <laughs> and uh, anyways, um, we we hung out, we got to know each other, and and he was looking for help um, too. Uh, and so I said, well, I, I, I'd love, like, this is T.J. Thompson, even in 1999, he was famous, and uh, so it was a bit of, a bit aw, star, starstruck and awestruck, and um, anyways, I went down and I hung out with him for a week, this was long after that first guy that I didn't work with, and um, and we ha- I had a great time, and uh, for a number of reasons, the the two biggest of which was a I had opened my own store and made a huge capital investment in my own store about three months before meeting him, and b about five well I don't know three months two months whatever before meeting him I met the woman who would become my wife, um, so you know I wasn't really keen on moving at that point, um, but uh, but I I could have ended up moving there and working with him but in that one week that I spent with T J in his old shop and was conquered. Um, I learned so much of what I now do for guitar repair, bridge making, neck resetting, um, just anything you can think of to do with guitar repair in one week of just hanging out with TJ really set the foundation for everything that followed. And then after that, I went home with the knowledge that I, you know, acquired at that week and, and, um, and went from there, you know, and then and then folk, and then practice neck resetting and practice making bridges and practice refrets and replacing bits and pieces on guitars and stuff like that. But um, that one week was my learning curve, and then everything since that week has been self-taught or or discussion. You know, you have discussions with other repair people, whomever it is. I mean, maybe it's Frank Ford's frets site that gave me some ideas about things, and you just take little bits and pieces of of whatever discussions you have with people or interactions and, and you kind of synthesize them with what you've, you've got going on. And um, There's no question that if I was able to, you know, work with a guy like TJ for a year, that I would have been accelerated by 10 years in my own process of guitar knowledge, maybe even maybe even more than that. But um, um, we, people don't have that opportunity. You know, I think that the, the guitar repair schools that are operating right now are in, immeasurably helpful. I would have loved to have gone to a place that specialized in in uh, finish repair. You know, it's not something that I consider my strong suit. I do finish work. I'm, I'm, I'm picky about it. I have a good eye for it, but it's not something that I have a lot of um, a lot of skill in. I, I got good at re- guitar repair because I was scared about messing up finish, so I got really good at taking guitars apart, so I didn't have to do finish repair. I, I'm convinced that that's why I'm a good repair guy now is because I can disassemble a guitar cleanly so I don't have to do finish touch-up. But um, that was born out of my lack of knowledge in finish repair. And, and um, man, having someone show me, you know, proper techniques of touching up finish or, 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 or spraying a sunburst, you know, any of this kind of stuff, oh, man, that would, be, that would have been huge, you know. And uh, so I, these people that are learning how to build guitars now, um, in places where they actually teach you that stuff, you know, Gallup's Repair Hospital or something, um, <laughs> those guys are getting such a seriously good leg up um, on everyone else. Now they just got to go do it a bunch and practice, and they're going to be unstoppable. They're going to be amazing. So there's lots of lots of potential in the world right now for repair people that that are great, and uh, it's really nice that those between these schools and the internet and the community of sharing that all these people are, are, you know, getting their hands dirty the right way. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Got to, got to give another shout out to Craig Korth. In addition to being along with you, one of my favorite Canadians and living in (laughs) Nelson, one of my favorite Canadian towns. Uh, he's, you know, I'll run into him at Wintergrass and he's handing eight year olds, his Lloyd Lore mandolin or his herringbone or his flathead banjo to try out. And (laughs) it's incredible. Like there isn't enough of that going on. And and he's such a sharing guy. He's 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 unique. There, I don't think I've ever met anybody like him um, in the world. And, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty special dude. Anybody out there, go meet him. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he listens to this podcast, but he should. I don't know. Yeah, seriously, you should podcast. You should get him 
chit chat with you on a podcast. I might have to go to Nelson to do that. Yeah. yeah I think it's worth a trip. A good little <laughs> write off trip to Nelson. Wait till ski season. Exactly. There you go. Well, Mark, you have uh, a lot of repairs to do, and I don't want to hold you from those. So. All right. I'm going to let you <laughs> I go. get back on it. Thanks so much for talking. This was great. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I'll talk to you whenever next time is. Yeah, you're one of our recurring guests. No, hopefully. Yeah, for sure. All right. Thanks, thanks Mark. Yeah. Bye. Cheers.